So, hi everybody once again, I'm Bhante Sujata, welcome to Dhamma Threads. And for this, the uh, third uh, in this series of conversations, I'm very uh, honoured to uh, introduce you to my uh, dear friend, Ayeshe, who is one of, the, uh, one of the gems of the Buddhist scene here in Sydney, and has been a friend of mine for I think, more than 15 years now. And uh, Ayeshe has been an Australian nun ordained in the Tibetan tradition and Sakya uh, lineage. And she has, over the last several years, been uh, much of the time living in uh, Maharashtra in India, uh, where she founded uh, a organization called the Bodhicitta Foundation, looking after some of the most poorest and disadvantaged people uh, in India uh, and trying to raise them up uh, with the Dhamma. Uh, so, and actually, you've just come back from India a week or so ago. Yeah. yeah? How's it going? Um, yeah, it's going pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 47 degrees when I left. Nice. And um, I mean, I mean, there's been ter these terrible droughts, right? I mean, the whole yeah. areas were depopulated. Uh, well, there's water shortages, and they yeah. say by 20, 30, 40 percent of Indians won't have drinkable water. So global warming is affecting. Uh, that's yeah. just one article I read. I don't know how yeah. factual it is. Yeah. Um, but global warming is hitting India. Right. And, um, and I mean, the, the, these environments are pretty extreme already, right? Yeah. So they've had record temperatures um, right. all across India. And quite a few people have died. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And animals. Yeah. Drought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, what I'd read was that the water shortages were so bad in certain regions in the south that basically the entire villages had just left. Yeah. Uh, because there's nothing to drink. I mean, you, what, what can you do? Yeah. yeah. I mean, or otherwise, even in the area where I live, um, there are days when no water comes, mm. so you have to collect the water for a few days. Right. And the, the wealthier people can pay a tanker to deliver water. Right. But yeah. the poor um, really suffer, you know. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, just to sort of round off that story, just mm. then, then just yesterday or something, and then there's kind of the news that there's a, a cyclone hitting. Where? In, uh, in India somewhere. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, yeah, this is not good. Yeah. Anyway, just to come back to that, that thing, so, sorry to kind of plunge you into this, but I'm just trying to come paint a bit of a picture. Unfortunately, I've never had, the, had visited you in, in Maharashtra, which I should have done. But so, so just to give us a, paint, paint us a bit of a picture about the place that you, you have there. Like, is it in, a, in a, 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 an urban environment or is it in the country or what kind of? Mm. context is it? So it might be better if I just talk about the group sure. that I work with and the historical background. Sure. Um, there is uh, many different castes or social stratas in India divided according right. to the Hindu religion and the people from the lowest caste who are said to have come out at the feet of God. Right. Um, so it's, it's not just class, it's religiously sanctified discrimination right. or slavery. Yeah. Um, these people were called uh, untouchables, so-called untouchables, or Dalit is a more PC term. Um, and these people for thousands of years were forced to do the most demeaning kind of work for no money, like skinning dead animals, cleaning toilets, sweeping. Um, and, you know, if they rebelled against their condition, they were lynched. Right. Um, and Dalit women, a bit like African Americans in the time of slavery, were regularly, you know, um, sexually abused and raped and so forth. So it's a lot better now because their leader, Dr. Ambedkar, who was one of the first Dalits to get an education, he was like the Martin Luther King Jr. of his people, right. converted to Buddhism in uh, 1956 with 100,000 people in Nagpur, central India, which is where right. I live. Right. So where I live is the hotbed of Dalit activism. It's okay. a city of about 2.2 million people. Okay. And about 14% of the population is Dalit. Okay. Um, but actually, Dalits are about 20% of the population. And if you include other backward castes, mm. they comprise the majority of Indian society. They, they call themselves... Uh, uh, the Bahujan community, the common people, the majority. Okay, Bahujan. And for a long and that's time. A f familiar phrase in Pali. Oh, what does it mean? Well, it's one of the stock phrases of the Buddha, Bahujana Hitaya Bahujana Sukhaya, for the, for the happiness and the welfare of, of the, the Bahujana. Yeah. The majority. Yeah, yeah. nice, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, but for a long time, the majority was controlled by the minority, especially right. uh, from the Brahmin community. Right. Um, 
and the you know the land owning castes who own most of the land and the resources. Right. Um, so Dr. Ambedkar uh, fought for reservations in government schools and jobs right. um, for Dalits who previously didn't even go to school and couldn't enter a temple, couldn't drink from the village well. Right. Um, and you know, you know, he he passed away very soon after converting to Buddhism. So the process of teaching right. people Buddhism wasn't completed. Right. It was kind of. Yeah. Promising start. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it was really a social movement. It was, at at that time, you know, most Dalits couldn't even read and write and were struggling just for the next day's food, you know, Mm. let alone thinking Mm. about enlightenment or something as abstract as that. So, uh, unfortunately, mostly now the Dalit scene in Nagpur is still mostly political and about social justice and establishing basic Right. Things like, okay. you know, basic human rights. Yep. But it, it has improved a lot and there is a growing middle class of Dalits. There is Dalits who are highly successful, who have um, migrated to other countries. Um, right. But it's still, you know, the majority of Dalits still are oppressed by right. the idea of caste. Because in India, they'll ask you, what's your surname? And as soon as they know your surname, they can pigeonhole you. Right. Seventy-five percent of Indian marriages is still according to caste, right. which is a form of social engineering. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, you mentioned that, that some have, have had some immigrants, and we, of course, we've made some contacts with the Ambedkar community here in Sydney. Yeah. And I, I think you you met them as well before. Is that right? I, I think so. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think we mentioned your name, and they said, "Oh, yes, yeah, we, we, we know." Okay, yeah. So anyway. So, because because we're in Harris Park, and because a lot of the Indian community comes there yeah. with their delicious curries, which we all enjoy so much, <laughs> and the uh, uh, yes, yeah, so there's a kind of small community, but it's interesting because you know these these the people who've come here, obviously they're kind of middle class, they're usually working in IT or something like that, yeah, and it's obviously they're interested in finding a Buddhist identity, which is quite different from what mattered to their parents yeah and which lifted them up from that that state so that's a kind of a, you know that's the stage of the journey that they're at right now yeah yeah um, so I went to Nagpur about 10 maybe 12 years ago and right. um, they the people there were incredibly enthusiastic to see a foreign monk right and um, they wanted you know many blessings and pujas and things like right. that I kind of became a celebrity <laughs> like but after a while I just realized uh, I don't want to just be a stomach you know I don't want to be a holy stomach you know uh-huh. like I want to actually do something to help right. the people right. can, and, can, can, sorry to interrupt but just yeah. can, I, can I just like like I, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard this from you before like how did you actually end up there in the first place why did why did you go there um so I was uh Basically, you know, my life as a nun has been very challenging. I wasn't yeah. accepted by my own tradition. There is no support for us. Yeah. Most of us disrobe, 75% disrobe. And I was studying this very dry Tibetan philosophy in Dharamsala. And okay, I missed so socially engaged Buddhism that I right. used to do in Australia. Right. Like when I first ordained, I, uh, I would volunteer at Wayside Chapel with um, phone counselling right. and suicide hotline and okay. I just missed the social, I, I got lots of invitations to teach in drug and alcohol rehab centres, right, right. schools, prisons right, right. and I really felt that that was very um, meaningful and juicy yeah. when people are really suffering on the edge of suffering, they're real about their practice and they're real about finding solutions to mm. end suffering yeah. and I missed that intensity. Um, right. So. Uh, you know, and when I was in Dharamsala for two, almost three years, I was just debating things like, is the colour white a colour? What is the horn of a rabbit? Like, obscure philosophical things for privileged people who don't need to worry about um, the suffering of ordinary people, which was so often the case in, in Buddhism, you know, especially Mahayana, which is, I think, <clears throat> one of the reasons why Buddhism disappeared in India, because the monks became so... Um, they withdrew into their monasteries and they uh, glorified the past and they debated obscure things and they lost touch with the common people and their concerns. I think this is a recurring pattern, right, in in religions when they get too kind of isolated and insular then then that kind of tends to happen. So is is the colour white a (laughs) colour? Just incidentally. (laughs) 
Um, oh, I can't remember now, I'm afraid. <laughs> But, um, but I mean, a lot of those things, are, I mean, fair enough, but also a lot of those things are there to sort of hone people's sort of logical thinking and so on. Yeah, and, and for certain kind kinds of, of people, yeah. Yeah. that's really meaningful yeah. and, and that's um, fulfilling. Yeah. But for me, it wasn't yeah. as a Western uh, woman. Right. And, and I think, mm. um, like I think one, one of the things that I've sort of uh, noticed in monastic life is especially, I don't know, especially, I think maybe, maybe, uh, it's hard to generalize, but maybe for Western people, because we, it's our, our monastic, um, it's less organic. Like if you grow up in an Asian society, you know, you see like your local village temple or something like that. It's just kind of around you all the time and you've grown up with it, you know. Mm. Whereas for us, it's more like an idealized. It's something that's much more separate from our actual life. And we see something and we're like, oh, we have this very idealized, very perfect idea of what it should be. Yeah. Uh, and that often is quite a long way from where it actually is totally. uh, which so, can be so give you so much disillusion right yeah yeah and I think one one of the things that we have to um, respect is that there are many different ways of living monastic life and there yes. isn't just one right way yes and the fact that it works for me great mm. but uh, other other people are different yeah but I also think in my tradition we haven't really successfully brought over the teachings in a way that is meaningful for, in particular, Western women. I don't feel we've um, crossed that bridge. We don't have an infrastructure. We don't have uh, a way of living. We're just kind of trying to copy and maintain and, and carry over the feudal patriarchal system of Tibetans right. that just doesn't work right. um, for Western women, right. you know? Yeah. Or, you know, any, any woman who's grown up in a, in yeah. a liberal, yeah. uh, gender equal, almost society well at least at least aspiring to be <laughs> 75 equal. cents to the dollar <laughs> right oh. at least at least at least you kind of acknowledge that it's a good thing you know yeah, yeah. i mean i think i think uh we're, we're kind of getting off i don't know where you want to go but no 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 i was just i was yeah. just interested in learning that background because you know yeah. when you say you know you went to dharamsala and you studied the tibetan philosophy but i don't have a picture in my mind of what that's actually like like is yeah. that a college where you have to apply to study do you just wander into a class what do you it have was, exams? Do you sit in a Do you yeah. sit in a desk and, and write on a book, or, or how how actually do, does that study go? We try to do the Tibet the traditional Tibetan course of studies, which is about fifteen years, but we do it just for a few years in right. a Western monastery. Because we've got to do everything quicker. <laughs> well, because you know we we haven't mastered medieval Tibetan, so we're trying to do it in English, or right. or in basic Tibetan without you know, broken yeah. language skills. Right. So we, we tried to learn Tibetan, we tried to... So this is a group of, of English-based Western monastics yeah. doing their version of a Tibetan, traditional Tibetan, of a Tibetan curriculum. Tibetan curriculum. Curriculum. Okay. In broken Tibetan. And, and is this specifically a Shakya no. curriculum or...? There is no... There is only one uh, nunnery for Sakya nuns in India. Right. Uh, and it, there are no Western... Okay monastics there. Okay. Um, so this was a non-sectarian right. Tibetan tradition monastery for Western women, okay. but there were lay people studying there right. as well. But most only last one or two years right. right? because they don't find it meaningful, they can't get a visa, they have health issues. Right. 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 Um, so something very different is needed, I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, which okay. is kind of another thing that I'm trying to do, but we can talk about that later. Um, so anyway, I went. I was in Bodh Gaya, which is the poorest and most in corrupt state of India. Bihar, yeah, yeah. And, where uh, the you know, where, where the where the chief minister was kicked out. The entire when I was there ten years ago, fifteen years ago, the entire state government was kicked out for corruption. Yeah. And the chief minister uh, was in jail, and his wife was the new chief minister. Yeah. Except she was illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> and he was running the jail from, in, from the state from inside jail. Yeah, yeah. it was actually sim similar to to when I was in Perth, actually, and we had <laughs> WA Inc. and we had two of our premiers in jail at the same time, which is a great achievement of the justice system. But anyway, reassuring. Yeah. Um, Anyhow, so you're in Bodh Gaya in yeah. Bihar, yes. So in this state, you know, girls are married at fourteen, that pop out right. eight kids dead by forty five. Right. Um, and that was not appealing to you? <laughs> and um, uh, I was just looking around and, and I saw the, 
you know, air conditioned marble right. uh, enclaves of Westerners with right. six foot high barbed wire fences out the front. Right. And then the conditions of the local people. And I was just contemplating the contrast between the, the two. And I was just thinking if the Buddha was here, which side of the fence would he be on? Right. Right. Uh, and and I, I thought to myself, it's because of the kindness of Indian people that we have Buddhism. So we owe them uh, a karmic debt. We owe them our gratitude yeah, yeah, for this course, beautiful of tradition course, yeah. of peace and awakening. And I thought at that time I must do something for Indians to repay their kindness, especially Indian women. Mm. Um, and, you know, they don't fare well on a lot of Indian women, not all Indian women, um, who are in the poorer category don't fare well in, in uh, kind of global standards for how likely they are to survive being born because of gender side. Yeah. Um, the chances of being of getting the same education, the same food, the same resources as their yeah. brothers. Um, you know, 22% of Indian women are illiterate and most will be married off without a choice. Um, you know, 40% of uh, Indian marriages have domestic violence. That's according to government stats. Personally, I think it's much higher. Yeah. Um, and there are about 50 million girls in uh, China and India that haven't been born. They were just aborted simply because they were girls. Mm. And there is around 55 million girls in developing countries just hoping to go to school as their brothers. They will always send the son to school first mm. because he is the, going to be the breadwinner, whereas the girl is just a thief at the table mm. who is going to go to another family and care for those parents. Um, and as I was thinking I should help Indians, this Indian man appeared before me in Bodh Gaya and just asked where he could get teachings. Okay. And he was quite well educated and, and reasonably affluent. And he was a Dalit man who had um, been part of the Tri Ratna community. Okay. They're quite active in Nagpur, they do some right. good work. Right. And he had immigrated to London and worked in their center in London. Okay. And. Um, and he told me about the Ambedkarite community. I'd never heard mm. of them, but when I did hear about them, I realized they were one of the most uh, unrecognized and perhaps poorest and most oppressed communities of all Buddhists. Mm. And I thought, this is exactly what I'm, you know, chomping at the bit to get mm. my teeth into something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they're, um, these are people who uh, are really motivated to help themselves. You know, they when I went there to Nagpur, they said, we don't, offer a dowry. Mm. We want our girls to be educated. We believe mm. in social justice. Mm. They're stirred up. Dr. Ambedkar said, um, educate, agitate, organize, stand up for your rights. Mm. Mm. And it's like, uh, you know, the match on the, yeah. on the Tinder or something, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, just ready to ignite. Sure, yeah. But uh, Nagpur is also the center, the central heartland of Hindu extremism like the RSS, which is the... Um, oh, really? Which is the organization that killed Gandhi. Right. And it has been responsible for the deaths of the burning alive of some Christian Australian Christian yeah. missionaries in Orissa. Yeah. So it's also a, a, a very politically heated So why, place. why is... I mean, is that... Because they don't want... Uh, no, no, well, sorry, but why, 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 why is Nagpur the center of the, of the Hindu? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there must... There must be some history behind that. Anyway. That there was, there like, is, yeah. probably. Um, yeah. But, so, uh, yeah, and at first I just did all these pujas for everybody and I couldn't understand okay. Hindi that well. Okay. And then one day so, somebody... So, 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 again, just, just so I can paint more of a picture in my, yeah. my mind. So, so you invited by this fellow down there and then there was a place? I stayed with his family. Stayed with his family? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in, just in Nagpur in the city, in the suburb in the city? Yes, yeah. yes. And so you said that he was, you know, he was obviously had got a job and so on. So he was, a, you know, not living in the slums he's an or something. NRI. Yeah. So he, he lived in London, but his family still live in Nagpur. Right. And Nagpur is basically an industrial city. There is nothing right, okay. historical or particularly beautiful there. <laughs> um, <laughs> forgive me. Apologies. The people are beautiful. The people are beautiful. <laughs> um, they grow That's... oranges. They're famous for oranges. Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, yeah. Okay, so you're in the city, and then you're doing the pujas. Now, you, you you like doing rituals and pujas and things, right? Not really. Well, you used to. I like doing my own Vajrayana practice, but I, I oh, don't like no. doing endless pujas every day for people who right. are not practicing. Right, yeah. You know, like 
if you give a talk in Australia, people will go home and practice it. Whereas if you do it in India, they're like, save us. Right, yeah. You know, just uh, you do this for us so yeah. we don't have oh, to yeah. do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And someone yeah. handed me a dying baby, a okay. baby with diarrhea. Yeah. And um, a newborn. And, and I just thought, you know, my puja is not what this baby needs. This baby needs $2 of diarrhea medicine yeah. that could save its life. Yeah. And for me, as a privileged white woman, I have the resources and I have the friends and I have the connections that could save more than one life. How many lives could I save? And, you know, women would, because I was a woman and because I was a monk, they trusted me. They opened up to me very quickly. And um, I've always found this as a, as, a, as a nun that people just open up to you really quickly. Like the, the second day I ordained someone opened up to me and said they were suicidal and another man confessed he was a, a pedophile and I was just like something about me, <laughs> something about the rose, people want to confess. Um, and this woman showed me the bruises of where her husband beats her mm. and I just thought, you know, you have to have skillful means, upaya. It's, it's, uh, it's wrong to give someone spiritual platitudes course, when their yeah. stomach is empty. Of course, yeah. So. Yeah. I have to respond to the suffering I see in front of me. And the suffering yeah. I saw in front of me was very deep. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, while I was there, several children died from typhoid and, mm -hmm. you know, just curable diseases, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, what if that was my time? Ba basic, obvious stuff that we don't, we know, it's just, it only exists because we don't care, because we don't Basically, prioritize it. Yeah. 40,000 kids die every day yeah. because we don't care. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that thing you said about the the way the the, the, the what the what the Indians want from you, and this is exactly my experience in uh, Ipo. Mm. <laughs> and this uh, Indian lady came to the temple I was at one time, and she just seen me out walking for arms round, and she just sort of comes up and says, "So, oh, uh, can you do some uh, chanting for me? I have some some bad dreams, and I want the bad dreams to go away." I'm like, "Sure, I can do some chanting for you." I'm just you know chatting with her and said, "Look." Is there any reason that you've been having bad dreams? You know, you have, you know, had been under any stress or anything like that. And she just looks at me with this com complete confused look and said, "No, no, no. You do the chanting and make my bad dreams go away. <laughs> just do the job." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Uh, from but, there, but, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's interesting though. I mean, it's interesting that when, when, when people are in such dire straits, right, and so many, so, uh, such a difficult material situation, um, that they're turning to some kind of, and, and I mean, kind of the background in the Dalit are untouchable, you know, the whole kind of history is of basically being betrayed by your spiritual tradition and not valued by it, right? But somehow they're still looking for some spiritual solution to problems. Um, I mean, is that is that because they've given up hope for actual material improvements and that's all they've got left? Or, like, it, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Why, why, why they would still want that? I think part of it is cultural. Um, to be honest, I think most people in Nagra are mostly quite materialistic and looking for a better life well, materially, which you can't blame have, them for. People everywhere, yeah. But, I mean, I think a bit like white people in the 50s, like we really believed that material things could make our life better and would make, make us happy. Right. And I think there at that point, you know, whereas now we kind of know that materialism is not going to make us happy. I mean, it can make life easier, but it doesn't always... Sure make us happy it makes yeah. life more complicated and it's destroying the planet but for them you know their basic needs haven't been met and until right. those basic needs are met sure know, meeting a spiritual potential is a little hard sure yeah, yeah. because they still think that those things oh absolutely yeah. they haven't had yeah. those things yeah. you know yeah. so yeah. but it i don't know yeah, I mean, they do. They do want that spiritual element as well. Yeah. But but whether they want to actually do it themselves is right. another thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So so you, you you went there and you counted this this thing and then you have to like uh, um like like I think one of the things that's really difficult you know when when if we're in 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 a position that we are like you said you know we're we're, we're privileged we're we're 
born into a white society and we're, you know, relatively wealthy and we you know we get an education and get a good health system and all of those kinds of things. And we feel that obligation, well, okay, we'd be good for us to, we should help people who are less uh, well off. Mm. But then, of course, how do you actually do that, right? And how do you do that in a way where you actually really are helping and not just um, undermining everything? Like one of the defining events in my lifetime, and I'm not sure if it's as defining in your lifetime, but one of the defining events in my lifetime was Live Aid. I don't know if you remember Live Aid when that happened. Yeah. Were you around? Was that in your era? Were you around mm. when that happened? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I mean, I was a musician, so it was kind of doubly impactful. Mm. And, you know, it was an incredible moment, right, that everybody came together and did this thing and say, well, let's express solidarity for people and let's, let's uh, raise money and let's use technology. I mean, it was unprecedented what they did with technology in, in, those, in that time, mm. concerts on different, on different continents or broadcast. And let's do something to help change the world. But of course, the problem is that almost all that money got wasted. Live, live Aid was almost, you know, most of the money got diverted to the, um, to the uh, dictators and generals mm. who, who uh, used it for buying guns and stuff. Mm. So if you're so, everyone feels good about it because, you know, I mean, what's not to feel good? I mean, if Freddie Mercury's out there singing his heart out <laughs> to uh, raise money for we the, the poor, <laughs> right? I mean, that sounds great. But the reality is that unless you're actually there on the ground, how do you make sure you're actually doing something that's good for people? Um, you consult with the people right. who are uh, affected by the situation and you're, you're trying to fix right. and mm -hmm. you bypass the middle class bureaucracy that, okay. that you go to the grassroots. Right. And I spent time with these people for a year before I even started to think about right. um, and I asked them what they needed and they said education. Right. Um, and, and I saw that the women needed jobs, you know, right. the women were sitting at home not making any money right. and because of that they were, they had to stay in bad marriages, abusive marriages and they weren't respected because they didn't earn an income right. and their work wasn't respected. Right. Um, I mean women do 60% of the world's work and own 10% of the world's land and, and a, a lot of uh, women's work is not respected, you right. know, caring, right. bringing up the next generation. Right. Um, you know, having a small garden, you know, small, right. small right. scale farming yeah. that feeds the family. Yeah. Um, so I think there are still good charities that exist, you know, on the ground, small grassroots charities. And right. I do believe um, it can make a difference yeah. uh, one, one person at a time. You know, you just need to investigate where the money is going and, and do your research and find a good charity. There are good charities that exist. Right. I mean, our charity runs on the income of two Australians per year, mm -hmm. around eighty or ninety thousand right. dollars, and we help roughly two thousand people a year, directly right. or indirectly. Right. I mean, you know, yeah, the people we help on a, on a large scale level, maybe a few hundred. Right. We sponsor fifty-five kids for school. Um, we train about a hundred women a year in sewing, computers, uh, beauty therapy, uh, and English. Um, we make 6,000 meals per year for undernourished kids. Right. Um, we run retreats, right. um, meditation, because you know, there's, if you're living in a slum, if you're living in poverty, you have mm. a lot of stress. Right. And, and if you're oppressed, you know, if you're mm. treated like garbage by your mm. boss, if you're in a job that it's never enough money, right. you need relief. You need mental and spiritual relief. Well, right. I mean, and this is the whole kind of thing that these days is that, that I mean, you even see that in Sydney is that meditations, they are, uh, uh, you know, almost all the meditation classes are in the eastern suburbs and it's all, all the, the uh, upper middle way, as they, they say. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to set up a little Bihar in the West, you know, and to try to bring it to people who, because it's not... They're the, <laughs> where the actual suffering is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, obviously, in a much lower, lesser degree. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, I mean, I, when you, when you say that, I mean, it's just incredible to me. It's just it's just unfathomable to imagine what the the work that you've done and the courage that you've had and the commitment that you've had to bring that to those people. And you know, I could never do it. 
and you know you've been one of my heroes for many years to be able to have that incredible compassion to bring that to people and uh, yeah I mean that, that just that 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 thing that you said because because I know that that for you that I mean the, the, the whole name of the foundation the Bodhicitta Foundation I mean it stems from that kind of aspiration of compassion and, and universal compassion for all sentient beings which is I think at the roots of your spiritual motivation and your spiritual quest. Mm. Yeah. When, when, like that, 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 that kind of difference or that kind of dichotomy, I guess, between the somewhat out of touch sort of education that you were getting, you know, in a formal Buddhist setting. You know, and there you actually, you know, they, they, in there you're kind of learning the texts about bodhisattvas, and here you're actually living like one. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering, like, but it's still not, like, like not completely disconnected, right? So it's not, you know, we, we, you might not be in Dharamsala learning those particular texts, but there are still teachings and so on which are going to be inspiring you and guiding you yeah. in the values. What are they? What, what, are the, what are the things or the teachings or principles that... that that inspired you, or, or that that gave you gave you hope in those dark places. Um, I think if it wasn't for the Buddhist teachings, I probably wouldn't be alive, actually, mm. and um, I certainly wouldn't be doing a charity in a slum in central India. Yeah. Um, I left home at fifteen, and I was a street kid. My yeah. father died when I was 14 and it pushed me into a suicidal uh, existential crisis in search of the meaning of life. Mm. Um, and I just traveled all over Australia and, and then to India looking for the meaning of life and then I found it in Buddhism. And the, for me, the essential text was the Bodhisattva's Way of Life by Shanti Deva. Right, yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah. may I be okay. the bridge, the boat, the medicine, yeah. may, I in, may I be a light in dark places. Mm. Uh, in a time of famine, may I turn to food. For those who are lost, may I be a great friendly host. Um, as long as space remains, as long as there are those who suffer, may I too remain to remove the darkness of the world. Mm. And the thing is, um, there is this habit... I'm, um, get, I'm getting a little chills while you're saying that. <laughs> there is this habit amongst people to glorify those who do good, um, to distance it from themselves and from their own moral responsibility as human right. beings in a, in a connected world. Right to yeah. do something to uplift their fellow humans. Right. And I am no different from anyone else. It's just that I, I've been touched by suffering myself. Mm. And because I know my own suffering, I can empathize with others. Why, why um, is someone else's suffering any more important yeah. than my own? Yeah. You know, as, as a young girl, um, I was, you know, sexually abused by quite a few men because I was on the street. Mm. and. That's why, because I know what that is like, that's why I have a girl's home now, to mm. keep those girls safe, you know, so mm. they're not um, becoming victims of human trafficking. Mm. So they're not abused, so they can reach their potential. Mm. So they don't grow up thinking the world is a cruel place, yeah, yeah, so that yeah. they can reach for their dreams. Yeah. So I think the, um, this meditation on the kindness of the mother and, and it's kind of seeing everybody has been your mother or, or a carer or a loved one, mm. not only in this life, but in many past lives. Yeah. And if you view everyone like that, it's just as important as yourself. How can you not do something? And, and you start, like I just started with one girl. Yeah. I hung out in her house in the slum. I saw what her life was like. Mm. I looked at the conditions which created her oppression. She was like my, my first... Um, experiment you could say to right, you know right, right. and and my connection with her was the catalyst to understand the situation of many uh, Dalit women and girls right. you know, and men as well the men suffer as well there's mm. a huge amount of alcoholism and frustration mm. depression suicide is amongst mm. the men there as well mm. Mm. and then you know gradually I just make pa posts on Facebook and then more and more people got involved mm. you know for some reason like at, at, when I first ordained, I tried to create a monastery for Western nuns, right. but the interest wasn't really there because a lot of people think monastics are anachronisms. Right. They weren't interested in supporting that. Whereas when I made a post about the poverty in India, mm. people people got on board with that. 
So it right. just grew and grew. And as the money came, then we just increased the work, you know, and we, we got the idea of sponsoring a child, you know, right. and we, uh, we have tax deductibility now. And like, and, and you do all these things, like you don't have any like training in aid work or anything like this. The best person, the most qualified person for social justice work is the one who is experienced in justice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was a street kid. Yeah. I'm uniquely qualified. Yeah, uniquely qualified. And yeah. I did I did a counselling course. I, I worked at Wayside Chapel. Right. Um, in King's Cross. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it, we, we've just been having a conversation with, with Auntie Fran and, and, you know, some of the things, so many things that you're saying resonates with her life as well. You know, she also was, you know, 14 different homes she lived in when she was a kid and these kinds of things. Mm. And she... Um, but also, also that thing like of, of like the, the kind of knowledge comes from, like for her it was always about curiosity, right? So seeing, seeing what was in nature and then asking the questions and then sort of getting that kind of embedded knowledge that's got kind of from the ground up and from experience rather than coming from a, an idea that you can sort of master all the knowledge sitting in a classroom. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So have you heard everything you wanted to hear about India? Not really, but I've heard, I've, heard, I've, heard, I've heard a few things. But uh, if you want to, if there's something else you want to talk about, please, please uh, raise something else. Yeah. Okay. That's, so, a, that's that's enough. I mean, that's that's yeah, given yeah. me a good idea of well, what's going on there and so on. I think so. That's, that's yeah. really interesting. Uh, maybe I'll just I'll just wrap it up by saying we have a girls' home for girls yeah. aged 15 to 25, and we, uh, you know, keep them safe, and we take girls from villages who can't right. afford to go to school. Um, or who are, you know, going to be pushed into sex work or um, child labor. Right. And, um, and we take them and, you know, we train them as social workers to then go out and be agents of change in their own community. Right. And, um, you know, there's this story of a, a child, like there were all these starfish washed up on the beach, you know, thousands, you know, just dying in the sun without the cool water to revive them. Mm. And this little child was there with, uh, with just a little shovel and a little sand bucket collecting the starfish and throwing them back in the water. And somebody walked past and just said, this is a futile job, you know, mm. you can never rescue all these starfish, why even bother? And the child just looked at defiantly at that person and put a starfish in the bucket and threw it in the water <laughs> and said, it made a difference to that one. <laughs> so don't think about what you can't do, you know, right. think about what you can do. Yeah. And for those of us who um, who do want to do something for the world, but don't know where to begin, I mean, five dollars a day is the what we spend on a cappuccino. Five dollars yeah. a day could save a life. You know, sponsor a child. Yeah. yeah. Start from there. Talk to your friends. Go without something, mm. and then collect that money and find a reputable yeah. charity and do something. You know, or or create community. Everybody yeah. can start doing something. Right. Yeah. And if we all did that, yeah. the world would be a better place. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's one of the things, I mean, that um, Peter Singer has been talking about more in recent years is that, that idea, that kind of moral obligation that we have to act yeah. um, because there is such need. I think this is a problem that Buddhists have, that we're considered like a, a navel-gazing religion and mm. like samsara is broken, so don't try and fix it. Right. And there's this kind of misunderstanding of the idea of emptiness or selflessness to mean that we don't need to do anything because everything's an illusion. Right. And, you know, but actually, um, I'm speaking from a Mahayana point of view because I'm Mahayana. Please, but, of course, that's what we want but, to do. Yeah. But emptiness is not voidness. Emptiness means that we're interconnected. Right. So my happiness is not just a personal matter, it's a communal matter. So how can I be happy in a world where our children don't have a future? Right. There's, you know, we're going to have a collapse of society because of global warming. Or, yeah. you know, how can I be, um, you know, and, and like I have many non-self elements. The, word, the, the, the world, human beings are my second self. The, Without the water, I cannot exist. Without the earth, I right, cannot exist. Right. Without the air, I cannot exist. Right. So if I do harm to those things, and if I do harm to other human beings, like for example, if I get a cheap sale 
I mean, what Bangladeshi woman was making my clothes? What price did she pay for my right. cheap my cheap sale? Right. You know, so uh, if I want to live in a compassionate, happy way, mm. if I want to find salvation and freedom from suffering, yeah. I should not contribute violently to the sacred web of life that I am part of without which I don't exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The farmers are our second self, they grow our food. The women who make our clothes are our second self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why in my mind, um, social justice is very much woven into non-violence, compassion and ethics. S to be spiritual is to see the web of life mm. and to have uh, intimate love and compassion for all beings mm, mm, mm. and uh, to see the suffering and do something about it yeah. in not mm -hmm. just a spiritual platitude but in a practical way. Yeah. To mm. me that is what Dharma is, yeah. Yeah. is to wake up to the sacredness of interbeing. Yeah. 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 It's not um, abandoning, you know, it's not a spiritual bypass, it's not abandoning emotions, yeah. it's not abandoning um, our dark side yeah. because without acknowledging our dark side we won't have the power to become a fully authentic awakened being but anyway I'll stop with my platitudes and, now <laughs> no, and, and 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 you can't connect with 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 others as well yeah but but you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't uh, say you shouldn't dismiss those things as platitudes like I can understand how they can become platitudes but to me you know if I hear you speaking them to me they have that authenticity because I know that you live you know, it, that these are the values that have shaped your life, you know, that they're not just something you just learn sitting around in a, in a classroom or something like that, but, you, but they're, they're, they're really kind of meaningful for you. you know? I have a question for you. Do you? Yeah. Good. I've, I, I also have a question for you. Uh, is, are we moving on from Nagpur? Because I had one more question Go about on. Nagpur for Absolutely. you. And maybe we can come back to your question in a minute. But I, I, I just wanted to know, like you mentioned, it was like 47 degrees and you're leaving there. And I, I, in the time that you've been there, have you noticed, like, what's, what about the, ch the changes in the environment and the climate and the air and things like that? Have you actually seen changes in the time that you've been there? I think it's getting hotter. Right. I think the, the summers are getting hotter. To right. be honest, when I look at the sky there, some mornings I can't tell if it's overcast or blue sky right. because it's so polluted. And when yeah. we fly over it, yeah. it's this dark cloud of yeah. pollution. It's kind of... A bit like they describe Victorian London with all the smog, right? Um, oh, because no, yeah, yeah. a lot of industry uh, exists right. in Nagpur, and the people I work with work in factories. And for example, the one of the slums where we live, you know, the water is so filthy um, it could kill people. Mm -hmm. You know, they just there is no regulation over. I mean, even the Ganga, you know. Right there is no regulation over or it's not very well policed yeah, about yeah, yeah. the pollution and yeah. you know a lot of people get waterborne illnesses where i live right, right, right. and and because it's like a city so i assume that there's not much in the way of nature inside the city no right? there's a few gardens a few gardens or parks or yeah. something what about outside the city like is there other wilderness areas or anything outside there most is there um you know Farming land. Farm, farm land. I mean, yeah. there, there's a person born in India every 1.8 seconds. Yeah, yeah. It's quite scary, actually. Yeah. The population growth is out of control. Yeah. I, don't, I honestly don't know how they're going to fare into the future yeah, with yeah. such a huge population. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We, we, we were in Central Australia uh, a few weeks ago and did a retreat and mm. uh, just near uh, Kings Canyon. And we stayed in a little Aboriginal community there. And um amazing place and you know you go there and it's like there's like nothing right i mean this is in the middle of australia there's like nothing forever <laughs> right <laughs> and one night like so we would sit in the evening we'd sit and have a dhamma talk around the, the fire and then go back and sort of i was staying in a creek bed with a swag of you know out in the bush a bit i was walking along the road and you know, in, in Central Australia, and even in most places in Australia, the, the night sky is like really clear and really bright, and you know you can see the stars really beautifully. We're walking down this road, and I just looked up at the stars, and it was it was so incredible. I, I literally stumbled, and my, my jaw dropped open. I was so gobsmacked at the sky. Yeah. It was just um just incredible. It yeah. was uh, everything was three D and bright colours and 
detail that you couldn't even imagine. And there was uh, nothing special in your lunch that day. I, I, look, I, I do not, I do not, I, I, we should have checked. And, and I, I, was, I was like, what? I was just walking along this path, just like sort of, uh, oh, what's going on? And went, the next morning, I went back and like other people were saying, it was, well, it was really bright. And like the, you know, the, the, the local indigenous guys who were there were saying, oh, it was really bright last night. And you just walk around the bush like perfectly easily by starlight. There's no moon or anything like that. You just see everything. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, just incredible. And that's kind of nature. We've like drawn this veil over that. And we, don't, we don't see it. Yeah? We're out of touch. But what thing that really struck me there was that, you know, the guys who were, like, one of the main guys who we spoke to would have probably been in his 30s, I guess. Yeah. And he, you know, we'd be looking out of the, the bush and he's saying, well, this has changed so much since I was a kid. Right. He said, it was even more bright. No, not the, not the stars, mm. but just the bush. Right. And um, because it's all buffalo grass, it's all imported African grass. Oh, dear. Which, for the cattle. And the buffalo grass um, grows a lot closer together than the native Australian grasses. Mm. So cattle can feed on it better. Mm. But the problem also, because it grows closer, it burns a lot hotter. Right. So it kills all of the native seeds. Oh. And... And they've gone into areas where the buffalo grass has burned and 100% of the native seeds are, are gone. Mm. Because, you know, of course, normally the, the seeds need fire to propagate, mm. but it's just too hot, so they just die. Mm. And he's saying, you know, there used to be so many more wildflowers, there used to be so many more animals coming here. Mm. And he's just, this is, this is in central Australia. Mm. And he's talking about over, you know, a 30-year period, 30, 40-year period. Mm. Yeah. And... You know, there, there were pictures on the paper a couple of months ago, the drought in, in, um, in I can't remember the name of the town, some, somewhere in the northwest of New South Wales, north of Dubbo somewhere. Mm. And there, were, there was these, the river, and it was just like a, a muddy bed on the river. Yeah. And they were saying, you know, when we were kids, we used to play a game where we'd dive into the water and try to swim to the bottom and see if we could touch the bottom. Mm. And now that all there is is just cracked mud. Yeah. Uh. Even my Indian friends were saying that um, they used to need really thick blankets in winter, and they really enjoyed the Christmas right. Christmas crispness of the of Chris, the winter. The Christmas crisp, <laughs> the Christmas the Christmas of the Christmas. Chris, the Chris yeah anyway. Um, the, the cold. And they used to not, enjoy the cold. They don't get much of a winter now. Yeah. Mm. Um, but the population has just soared there. Right. Mm. But look, there are still beautiful places in India and um, where you can, you know, in the Himalayas where you can see the stars and uh, there are jungles as well. Right. But uh, these are increasingly islands. Increasingly very small islands, yeah. 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 So anyway, so I just want, that was a question I wanted to ask. But now come back to the question you were going to ask me a minute ago, if you can. So, uh, I mean, what... Uh, you've done a lot for nuns in, in terms of pushing forward um, and doing the research to support the reordination of right. the reintroduction of Theravadan bhikkhuni ordination. Right. And I, I think um, perhaps, like many monks, you, you started out, you know, focusing on your own practice in isolation. Right. Right. What made you wake up and, and think about including women, including 50% of the population in, in Buddhism? Well, 50% depends how you count it, right? If you talk about the people who actually show up at a monastery, it's more like 80 to 90%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I guess a few things, but one thing that, that did sort of really make me think was when, when talking with my sister and she just said, um, she just said in a very kind of uh, low-key kind of way, not uh, that, that she said, oh, she could never really follow any of the different religions because none of them really gave women a fair go. Mm. And you know, she wasn't being attacking or anything like that, but it's just like her, her options in life, you know, if you, if you believe that, that you shouldn't be discriminated against because of your gender, then why would you want to follow any of these religions? It's a good question. Mm. Yeah. So that was one of the things that really made me sort of start looking at things differently. 
Uh, but there's a lot of other things. I mean, another, another, you know, these things they all come together, right? So it's always it's kind of a constellation of things. There were also some events that happened when I was a young monk at Wat Nanachar, uh, and I could see, uh, for example, I can mention a lot of different events, but one that when, when I was first there, there was a Western nun, ten precept nun, who was staying in the monastery, Sister Sangamita, and she would come for arms round with the monks. Right? And uh, so we'd go out, and that, that was like literally from the very first time that I went for arms round, mm. that was what we did. We went, the, the, monks, the monks went for arms round, and this Western nun would come along with us, and mm. we'd come back, and that was, that was how we lived. And then after about three, two or three years, something like that, then the word came down from the head monastery, from what Papangala, that nuns can't go for arms round, full stop. Mm. Yeah? And, oh, what's going on, right? And so these are things that were, you know, in some ways had been innovations introduced by Ajahn Chah, mm. which were gradually being rolled back after Ajahn Chah had died, uh, because the monks who came after him didn't have the guts that he did. Um, and so that's just one event. And then there's you know, a lot of different things like that. But another important thing was, well, oh, shit, that one. Okay, so there's pers those personal encounters, there's also like just studying the text, because as you know, you know, I do text study. And then when you study the text, you realize that all the arguments that people are using to justify this sexism actually don't really work. Right? So that's another thing. And the other thing was, uh, especially when I went to Malaysia mm. and stayed in Malaysia for a while and had some contact and meeting with Mahayana tradition and mm. especially with the Chinese Mahayana because the bhikkhunis are very strong there. Mm. So you could really see that difference of how it was just kind of normal to have a woman running a monastery, mm. you know, and having students and all of that kind of thing. It was just like, why would you make an issue out of it? Mm. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was some of the things that really made me change my mind. Yeah. And but but also seeing but also seeing all of the women who are coming to practice, you know, and women asking me, you know, where can I go? I want to ordain. I want to follow this monastic life. Where do I go? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Buddha gave women ordination two thousand six hundred years ago. He also included um, oppressed minorities like Dalits. Right. So right. why are right. we still two thousand six hundred years later d debating whether or not they should have they should be included in the sangha? <laughs> preaching to the choir, sister. Preaching to the choir. Yeah, the, I mean, the, because we have fallen backwards from what the Buddha taught. You know what I think happens with religion so often is that there is this saint or holy person who breaks down, right. who break, breaks down barriers and finds right. something timeless and beautiful right. that can be a salve and a light for humanity right. and make the world a better place, and then. Um, the powers that be see, oh, that's powerful. Right. Let's co-opt it to ride, you know, we'll ride the wave of the popularity of that beauty yeah. and, and become a state power. Right. So when religion and, you know, or spirituality, something inspiring and, and is married with state power, that is when it goes bad. You know, that's when, right. because patriarchy was married with Buddhism or, you know, a, a king and his power was married with Buddhism. That's when it becomes about pushing for the agenda of um, the state or patriarchy yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know. And that's why I think we need to separate that, those two. Yeah, and I mean, there's, I mean, there's, a lot, and I mean, that's obviously that's complicated. But there's a lot of issues that are uh, sort of brought up with that. I Meaning, the marriage of church and state is one thing. Mm. Um, but another thing which is actually I think people really don't pay enough attention to or don't appreciate that actually one of the one of the key driving issues is the ownership of real estate yeah yeah uh, like who owns the property mm. and for most people they don't really kind of think like that but you know this is absolutely a driving force mm. uh, especially in monastic environment because you know in principle the monasteries are owned by the Sangha Right, <laughs> which is an abstract kind of entity, right? Yeah. And uh, in you know, in reality, of course, they're often owned and managed whether by the local sangha, the local community, and they are super personal, right? So that their monastery lasts longer than any individual. So you have to, like have succession in the monastery, 
And uh, so this all gets very uh, complicated and very difficult to to handle. You know, it's one of the first one of the things that we encountered. Again, the thing that I think was little noted was that you know the the very first thing that happened uh, after we ordained bhikkhunis and Ajahn Brahm went to to Thailand and got dressed down by the monks in in Wat Papong who got kicked out of there. The very first thing that happened after he was kicked out was one of the monks said, "How can we get back to the monastery at Bodhinyana?" Right? How can we actually mm. get the land? Mm. And then they were like, well, it's not a matter of getting it back the land. It belongs to the Buddhist Society of WA. Mm. But from their point of view, it was their monastery and they should get it. And they had, there was like repeated efforts to hold petitions, to agitate people to, and so on, to get hold of the real estate. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, I think, and that's, of course, you know, power and wealth and prestige and all the things that come with it. Yeah. 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 But I mean, that was the radical nature of the Buddha to say that um, that anyone could attain enlightenment. Absolutely, and yeah. that everybody was welcome. Right, and that everybody had that potential. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I I don't think I was really interested in feminism before I became a nun. It right. was only when I ordained and realized there was nowhere for nuns. Right. And I was told to pray to be reborn as a man. Right. By someone who really meant well. <laughs> Um, you know, and I found myself cleaning the toilet and doing the dishes while the men sat on thrones, right. who are still sitting on thrones right. to this day. Right. That I started, it took me a few years, but I, it started to kind of click that, wow, I'm really, I've stepped into a role here. I've stepped into a culture and a role. Right. And, um, and I didn't sign up for that. Mm. Um, you know, and, and then I started to radically question the system that I was part of and, and thinking how right. I could um, divest myself from that. Right. You know, because I've seen so many women come and go from right. Right. the robes. So how do, how, do, how, do we, how do we, like, inherit the values of that tradition which are worthwhile? Because mm. obviously I, the, the, the actual... The, the values that the Buddha taught yeah. are still to some extent in that tradition. The values like simplicity and contentment and renunciation, at least to some degree, are, are still there. For the benefit accessible. of the many. Sure, sure. But yeah. there's still something there. Yeah. Um, so how do, we, how do we draw on that, those traditions and those ideas and those, those values uh, while still being able to live, live authentically with, the, with our values yeah. and with what, what we need? Uh, and this is, this is our challenge, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think even we can see it now in this kind of white neoliberal mindfulness movement, right. which is about making samsara more palatable. Um, right. and, and that who has access to those teachings? Right. Who's making money out of those teachings? Where is that money going? Right. Um, you know, do poor brown people have access to those teachings? Whereas those teachings were given for the benefit of the many, and, and who has access to that. Right. I mean, women are the biggest supporters of Buddhism, so right. um, why don't women have, you know, roles in leadership and, and access to resources as much as men, you know, when they are the biggest supporters of Buddhism, you know, and, and, and needing to question the, the power structures in our community um, and in our centers mm. and break down um, unhealthy, uh, not fair distribution of resources. Sure. Yeah. Mm. You know. yeah. Yeah. I was thinking. I was thinking about like you know we we, we, we try to do this and like you you've moved back from India. Like how how permanent is your move back to Sydney now? Um, so I I hope to start a hermitage. Right. Um, that is. Uh, you know, not patriarchal, right. and that is uh, f also, you know, more inclusive of the LGBTQI community right. and women. Um, and I, I hope to spend maybe 65, 70% of my time here from now on, but that depends okay. very much on support, which okay. hasn't okay. really been forthcoming. Okay, okay. Um, because I, I'm in this double bind where one, I'm not supported by my own tradition, which is extremely ethnocentric and patriarchal. Right. And I'm also not supported by a traditional um, ethnic 
Buddhist community, uh -huh. which Theravada monastics are. Uh -huh. So I neither have the support of traditional Buddhists nor my own tradition. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but but that's that's the plan to right. start a hermitage and, in and, Australia. And I, I very much you know, empathise with your your plight, and I know I know how difficult it is. Yeah. And I know, you know, for myself, you know, for us, it was very easy to come back to Sydney and we're like, okay, you know, we have good support from, you know, the Sri Lankan community and Vietnamese and many others. Mm. So it's easy for us to come back here and set that thing up. And uh, and I know that it's a lot more, lot more struggle for you. Mm. Uh, and you're up, you're up in the Blue Mountains at the moment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're on a property. Yeah. Okay. And it's uh, it's called Bodhicitta, uh, Bodhicitta Dakini. Hermitage. Okay, Bodhicitta yeah. Dakini Hermitage. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I wanted to, can I kind of just put a proposition to you or a thought? Can I just share a thought with you? <laughs> okay. I don't know if this is a valuable thought or not. It might be just a waste of a thought, but it was something that I thought just yesterday. And uh, in response to, who was it? I can't remember now. Uh, anyway, uh, somebody had made a remark to the effect that um, uh, that the sangha, the role of the sangha, um, would basic, basically that the sangha wouldn't have any kind of role going forward in in Western societies, or you know that we'd be developing a form of Buddhism that was entirely secularized, right? And uh, I mean, obviously, obviously, there's a kind of a degree of truth to that. I mean, obviously that. That's that's you know the matter of um, uh, you know a, a historical direction or whatever. But I was, I was kind of thinking. I mean, obviously, there's many many issues there, many issues to to be discussed there. But but one of the things that I was thinking about was like, um, and you, you excuse me because this is very ill formed. Because like I say, it's just like a half idea that I had. And I just wanted to to see but that, that what you mentioned before about. Uh, like the, the the mindfulness being kind of a neoliberal mindfulness idea, right? Mm. And 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 the fact that that is so, I think, has become better recognised in the last couple of years. There was even a um, an article in the Guardian just a few days ago. It was called something like the mindfulness something, talk, to basically talking about that same thing, right? That the mindfulness is used as a palliative to to uh, get people to be de-stressed so that they can go back to work and keep doing all the horrible things that made Tolerate them stressed. Tolerate horrible. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, and so it's used to kind of enable a system. And then, but then it occurred to me that then, well, what are your options, right? So one option is to then, well, change that system, okay? So you have a revolution or whatever, and you, 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 you make a different system, right? So that's one option. And I think that that's, that tends to be what the more committed of the secular Buddhist in someone like America or something end up doing, right? They sort of end up advocating for changing of the system in some kind of way, right? So, so through, you know, advancing uh, uh, whatever causes. And, that, and that's, that's kind of fine. But it occurs to, occurred to me that, that maybe with the Sangha, that the special role that the Sangha has is to work with that situation in a slightly different way. And rather than necessarily sort of... Um, you know, not necessarily playing a direct role to change that system, but providing an example of a different kind of system. So it's almost like a parallel thing. So if just, you know, for example, like the way that the Buddha set, set the Sangha up, where it would be consensus decision-making and ownership of, of property in common. Socialist democracy. An anarchist <laughs> collective, actually, right? right? I mean, these, it's, <laughs> Sangha is actually set up on the principles of an anarchist collective, and that's the defining features of an anarchist collective: is that there's no single leader. Uh, and so it seems to me, that, you know, it just occurred to me that that's a different way of seeing that thing. That that the, that the role of the sangha, in a sense, can be. I'm not saying it is, mm. right? But it can be as a role to model, uh, because it's somewhat insulated from the kind of wider society. It can kind of model. A kind of an idealized or a, a more progressive society that can bring these, that can that can implement these values in a smaller kind of context uh, that uh, can reflect back on what the changes that's happening in the wider society, and it can do that in a way that can't be done within a purely secularized environment. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think uh, you're probably right. You know, if you could get enough <laughs> progressive people together <laughs> yeah. and, um, and do that. I mean, I think people... But I'm even thinking like, you know, like mm. your, your place, like if you set something up in the Blue Mountains, then that can also be kind of a microcosm of that. Yeah. You know, it can be a reflection of whether you can actually live according to these values. And what we're teaching people, I mean, just, I'm making it probably sound more highfalutin than it should be. Mm. But I mean, just a, a simple example might be that we, we try to teach people, well, be content and use less things and, you know, be more environmentally conscious because that's good for your heart and it's good for the world, you know. And so we can actually do that as a sangha and we yeah. can actually design a monastery that's going to use few resources and it's going to be responsible and those kinds of things. So we're sort of setting up a model of a society that can reflect that thing in perhaps a way that's more pure than someone can do if they're working, say, trying to introduce Buddhist values into a corporation. Yeah, Where because it's, it's profit-based. <laughs> The thing I think that um, people in social justice often, a side that they miss, that makes their activism sometimes quite aggressive right. and not very sustainable, um, is peace. You know, is, is the idea of com compassion and tolerance and right. trying to see um, the goodness in, in, your, in your foe. Okay. You know, the connect okay. where you're connected, not just where you're not agreeing, but where you're connected and how you could reach a common ground. And um, in a lot of the spiritual traditions I've seen in every country, those, those contemplatives, those mystics are the mm. lungs of that society. They mm. bring a unique um, perspective because they're not um, working just for themselves mm. and they're not uh, ego-driven, the best ones are not mm, ego driven. Mm. And I think every society needs that perspective of someone who is not um, just mired in their own lives and the you know temporary problems but has a kind of timeless perspective. Right, exactly, yeah. And yeah. and has the spiritual lungs to refresh that society, to give them some peace, to um, be the mother of that community who is not just working for their own welfare. Right. And I think that role has always been played, whether, whether it's by wise women, herbalists, or whether it's by grandparents in the indigenous community, right. you know, the, right. the medicine man, woman. Right. Um, but there, there is always going to be a need for someone who is devoted to, to the common good, something higher than themselves, right. Right. who can offer um, a different perspective because they dwell in the two worlds of the, mm. the, realm, the realm of the spirit and the realm of the, yeah. <laughs> the mundane. Right, right. You know, and where those two meet. Exactly, yeah. I mean, and, and, and when you, you know, it's not as if that when you set up a spiritual community that somehow it's separate from the rest of the world, right? Yeah. I mean, you can, you can, you can have boundaries to some extent, but, but you know, it's still completely interconnected. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 very, the very possibility of it is, is still completely interconnected. Yeah. And, I mean, that's why I think uh, what we do as a contemplative will always be relevant mm. and I think it will never even though you know you may not have that many people being celibate into the future mm. there will always be medicine men and women and there will always be a need for that right, right. and there will always be there is a need for us yeah. as monastics to engage with the suffering of the world in a real and authentic way mm. Mm. but there is also a need for us to contemplate and maintain that uh, that sacred flame of wisdom to offer another perspective to a world which is quite troubled. Yeah, yeah. That's what I think. That's what you think? Yeah. Aya, uh, thank you so very much. Thank you, Bhante. It's been wonderful having a conversation with you and to hear about your experience and your wisdom and your uh, uh, plans. And I um, hope that you have every success in what you're doing. And uh, if it doesn't, if it's not successful, oh well, never mind. We can still come. You can hang, hang, come and hang out with us and have a cup of tea and, uh, <laughs> and sleep in my car on the weekend. Yeah, sleep in your car oh, on the weekend. That's really yeah. reassuring. Thanks. So that'll be fine. <laughs> and so uh, yeah, just to 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 um, to appreciate you for for all that you've done, and just so that you know that there are lots of people who appreciate you and who, who um, have found through you some, some inspiration to live the Dhamma a little bit more authentically. I would say the same for you, Bhante. Thank you for being an advocate for women. Sorry, I appreciate sorry, it. Sorry, sorry. Yeah.